Why was San Francisco so definitively the center of the tech industry? Why did it all like agglomerate here? San Francisco is the place in the world where you can manufacture luck. Within a month of us moving in there, they launched Twitter. I was like, like, wow, this place is like incredible. Everywhere here are people starting companies, really ambitious companies. And then COVID hit. In the last year, some things have happened that have turned things around. They feel the energy. I actually think the biggest factor is that. They have all the building blocks to make San Francisco into the best city in the world. Welcome back to another episode of The Light Cone. Today, we're talking about San Francisco. It was dead. But now, like Lazarus, it is back. And not only that, we've got a new thing to talk about, which is Cerebral Valley. People from all around the world are coming to move to San Francisco to just a few neighborhoods. We're in one of them in the dog patch to build the future, to build the future of AI. Why is that? What's going on? I think it's worth just charting the course of San Francisco over the last few years as a starting point. So we, we all got to San Francisco in 2006. San Francisco was coming out of its own doom loop <laughs> like Doom Loop 1.0 the from, from the dot com crash in the late 90s, San Francisco was f- full to the brim again. And then the dot com bubble burst. And when we got there, it kind of felt like a ghost town. Like all, there was a lot of vacancy, rents, rents had crashed. Um, and then what brought San Francisco out of the Doom Loop was the Web 2.0 boom. All these YC companies like Stripe and Airbnb and Dropbox moved to San Francisco and they started hiring employees who moved into apartments and like the tech economy just like dragged San Francisco back out of out, out of the Doom Loop. Uh, this is like very specific point like the Silicon Valley geography. I, I remember like when we were moving here in 2007, there was a real negative connotation about choosing to base your company in San Francisco instead of like Palo Alto. Yeah, Palo Alto, <laughs> Mountain View, San Jose, even like anything south. And I, I think it linked to the dot com era where the perception, the belief was that during the dot com era, all of the opportunists had come to and like moved into San Francisco because they wanted to like live in a cool city and have like cool things to do instead of like working. And it was a real conventional wisdom that post that era, If you were serious about starting a company, you choose to be based in like the peninsula. And if you chose to be in San Francisco, you were like actively choosing to not be serious about your company. It was a real negative, like investors really paid attention to this. Yeah. And we put YC itself in the South Bay. Should should we talk about where YC has been over the years? Yeah, Y Combinator got started in uh, Mountain View on uh, one of the most legendary streets at this point. It was uh, called Pioneer Way. And as Hart said in 2005, Mountain View was the place to be. Google had based its headquarters there, and people don't look at Google the same way anymore. But in 2005, Google was the undisputed king of innovation. All the smartest people wanted to be affiliated with Google. And so Mountain View became this mecca for smart people as the place where all the serious technologists were like conglomerating. Another major factor is just... In that era, people started people starting companies just tended to be slightly older, right? Like even like the ten, like the Google founders were PhDs, like late twenties, maybe it's so not old, but like not like twenty one, twenty two, just out of college. And I think even the late twenties, f- early thirties, yeah. and there and- was a lot of it from Palo Alto also because of uh, Stanford, right? Yeah, and people like wanted to be in the suburbs, basically, and and the investors wanted to be in the suburbs because they're all older. So it's just this natural pool. And then the first sort of young founder, Mark Zuckerberg, chose to be based in like Palo Alto as well, right? So like the serious up and coming startup was in Palo Alto. Stripe was also initially in yeah, Palo Alto. Stripe was also initially Palo Alto, but then I think like YC actually. Um, not because Paul wanted it to, but like it ended up contributing to the move to San Francisco. Like dramatically. Yeah. <laughs> like we probably pulled it forward by years. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's all a bunch of like young people who wanted to not be in the suburbs and they actually all ended up being in like the same building, right? Like you guys were living the in- The scraper. Yeah. Harge and I <laughs> lived in the same building. Um, this building in North in the North Beach area of San Francisco called Crystal Towers that came to be known as the Y Scraper because there were so many Y Combinator companies in it. We actually wanted to be living in the building, but we were rejected. Really? <laughs> yeah, we were rejected really? because we were we came to submit our application. They told us there were lots of space, um, and then they told us just to go around the corner to the leasing office to get it um, uh, filled. 
as I was walking out, I bumped into Justin Khan, who at the time was working Justin.tv, and so he'd walk around everywhere with a camera on his head, um, which it turns out the building did not like. So they they saw me talking to Justin, and they must have called the leasing office to say, reject their application. So by the time I got around, they said, there's no room left. <laughs> I was like, well, like, one minute ago, you said there was like plenty of room. It was like, um, um, but so we ended up like kind of living vicariously because we would try and come over to the building as much as we could for like dinners and lunches and just every time we would learn so much like you had the founders of dropbox and their script was in there uh weebly there's actually a very important point here i think which is for people who are builders it's actually important to be around other people who are like that so go you're know, anyone who has built something that you respect that you think is really good that you want to build things similar to that like try to be near them. Like actually, just being in a in community with other people like that greatly increases your chance of success. I mean, I think that was true for for us. I mean, that's why we for Posturus we applied to Y Combinator. Like we looked at, you know, Steve at Reddit, or we looked at a Drew from Dropbox or James from Heroku, and we said those are the kinds of things that we want to build. And I think you know today that that sort of continues. Like you want to be near people like that. I, I, my personal experience, I grew up, I was born and grew up in England, YC, reading Paul Graham essays and hearing about YC and getting accepted to YC in 2007 is the reason that I moved. But the initially I only planned on moving for three months. So that's how long we could stay on a tourist waiver. Um, but as soon as we got here, it was just like a complete world of difference. Like I went from being around all of my peers working in banking, consultancy, just thinking I was unemployed or too lazy to get like a real job <laughs> <laughs> and being in San Francisco and the Bay Area especially amongst the YC founders it was like hey like everyone's doing a startup everyone's like in the same boat we can all like support each other like it's just like in the water like it was my first time experiencing being in an environment that felt like nourishing versus draining for starting companies and you could feel that really intensely like just being in San Francisco and then you found yourself in one of those legendary rooms very early on with your first startup. Yeah, it was, again, just like a total um, serendipity luck factor. Evan Williams, the founder of Twitter, had happened to be speaking at a conference at my college in like 2006. And he'd, we sort of, my co-founder, who's my cousin, um, Corvier, like we spoke to him and he is like, hey, like if you guys move out to San Francisco, like we have some free office space and you should just like, we have some desks and you should just like come hang out there, um, which is what we did. And that startup at the time was called Audio, um, Audio, which is a podcasting company that was not actually doing very well. <laughs> and you could actually feel it in the office. But I mean, it's why they had space and free desks, right? Like they had more space than they needed. It was very much people were coming like nine to five. And so... It just wasn't like a, a super dynamic environment. But within a month of us moving in there, they launched Twitter and, and Twitter just like took off. And then suddenly like the whole energy in the place changed. There were always like interesting people coming in and out of the office. And just like you got really energized by being around something that was clearly working so well. And it made you want to like put in more effort and like feed off the energy. Oh, and what's funny is Harge's startup was in the same office as Twitter and it, the same time I was running a different startup and Twitter moved offices after they outgrew that space and they moved into my office building. And so my startup was actually across the hall from Twitter's second office. And this kind of like, this might seem like a, a bizarre coincidence, but it's actually like not that unusual because all of tech was concentrated into this very small area in like downtown and Soma. Like people who haven't been here don't don't realize just how dense it was where like you could go from any startup to any startup in San Francisco in like 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I remember a very specific example of that. Like we, we left the office to get lunch and we step outside and we bump into Ron Conway, like the like legendary angel investor. And he just starts asking us some questions and we start, and we met him at a YC event. Um, and we just told him like, uh, we've got like a bunch of problems. We really want like to get blah, blah, blah as a customer. And by the time we got back to our office, he'd like shot off these intros to all of the companies for us um, to help us like with like making sales. Like, I was like, wow, this place is like incredible. I mean, the crazy thing, I think San Francisco is the place in the world where you can manufacture luck and startups for them to really get big lots of things need to happen to be right. 
there's something special about being surrounded with all the people that kind of know how and they're all here and they're willing to help because starting companies is actually a very anomalous thing in other parts of the world. It's a strange job. And to your point, Harsh, starting a company could be looked at, oh, you're just a bum. You're not really working at the beginning. What is it going on? But here, people really celebrate it because people understand how hard it is. How is it for you, Diane? I'm curious, like, because you grew up in Chile. Like, how was the move to Silicon Valley and being yeah. around this culture? So it relate a lot to the story of being a misfit. So in Chile, when I grew up, I was always a weird kid, just stay indoors. Because it also was very difficult being the only Asian kid. There were no other Asian kids around. And I really loved reading books. And when I got a computer, I really like um, also building a lot of these RPG games back then, emulators. I got a lot into that. And internet was like my bubble, but I didn't know anyone like that. And what was cool is I always admired all the builders. And my dream was that at some point I would move to be in Silicon Valley and be there. And what was special that I didn't know, and there was this pull, is that when I got and moved to, uh, moved to Silicon Valley, I started working at Intel, was my first job. It's the first time I felt at home. There were a lot of people like me who really liked to nerd out and really liked to go deep on subjects and building. And I wasn't judged because I was judged back then. I had to sort of hide and not talk about my interests when I go in that super deep and that was special where it was celebrated and you can build and there's also the experts in different areas and everyone is just as deep as you with building and it's just as exciting and an optimist instead of being judged on why you like this weird thing uh, one of the funniest things that i remember from reading paul graham essays that i think was one of the reasons why a bunch of us found his essays um was he would always describe what it was like in high school to be a nerd <laughs> And then I, th I think that that might be a common experience for us where, you know, you sort of grow up in the in default society. Default society, you realize, is a little bit foreign. It has different values than you. It, um, you know, sort of values appearance more than sort of the substance. Um, and that you know, there's keeps a certain going. way to do it, right? The, and that kind of keeps going even after college. Let's say you, um, for young founders, their friend who may not be founders end up getting whatever the standard job, being an investment banker or working for consulting or whatever, or the big tech job. And they end up having this standard life where it's like, okay, they get the promotion, they get the nice vacations, they get the time off. And a lot of their meaning is more outside of work. And then when you're friends with, uh, nothing against that, by the way, <laughs> with, with when your friends are like that and you're doing your startup and you're working 24-7 and working very hard and not really having a lot of money to take the vacations, the fancy vacations, you kind of get a little bit judged implicitly, not directly. And that can be a bit demotivating. And I think what's special being here is you surround yourself with people who are in that same mode, in that same vibe, where they're also working hard and you're chasing your dreams to build something. And it's not looked down that you're not taking the fancy vacation and going to the fancy dinners. It's actually, on the other hand, celebrated that you're working hard and really taking taking the leap. You've got such a deep point, Diana. And I think that is actually the true reason why startups and startup founders conglomerate in Silicon Valley. Like some people think it's transactional reasons like oh this is where the investors are so you have to be close to the investors or like this is where the like employees are so you have to be like the place where you can hire employees and like those i actually think those are like factors probably more minor factors i actually think the biggest factor is that it's like people become the average of the people who they surround themselves with when you're in a city that doesn't value this kind of thing it's really hard to stay motivated it's really hard to be as ambitious when you move to silicon valley and you're surrounded by people like everywhere here here are people starting companies, really ambitious companies, people who are, you know, who are who are really trying to change the world in a very serious, very dedicated way. It just like wears off on you and it makes you motivated to want to do the same thing. It's also like um, there's a particular sense of like long term ambition here um, where like startups just take so long to actually work out and make any difference that everyone who starts out here is on that journey. And it's just, you know, I think 
altru- generally like altruistic and wants to make a difference, but you're also just very incentivized to think long term and um, not pay attention to sort of like short term status games. You care, you kind of care about like your relationships over a long period of time. And if you contrast that to say like a finance hub like New York, there's a huge amount of ambition there, but it yeah. is tends to be more like how much money are you making right now? And one thing we all see is people come to San Francisco or YC with maybe like they their ambition level like they think is at like you know like on two out of five scale but like they grow from all the other people and especially if the company starts doing well like their ambition changes right and so like and I think that's a very unique thing here where if you're working on like technology like there's almost no bound to like how far like your ideas can go it's just like how long do you want to keep pushing them and working on them for and if you're around like other people who are also interested enough in what they're doing to keep doing it versus trying to hit some like end state of success i think that's how you end up with these companies where you you have like larry ellison working on oracle for like decades like i don't think that happens anywhere else this is actually a, a place that generates social movements like we believe x like i believe that uh ai and large language models might reject recreate uh, every type of enterprise software. And that's happening like right before our eyes right now. Or we believe that, um, you know, elect- electrification and, you know, decarbonization will remake how we use energy in the world. Like that's sort of happening before our eyes. And then being around people who have those ideas, like not all of them are going to be right. Even having a culture where being wrong is okay, uh, that's very rare. And I think that's like, you know, having a truly inclusive place where it's uh, basically what do you believe and what do you believe that nobody else believes yet? That That's the very unique reason why I think San Francisco is the most special place in the world. Like right up until COVID, it was clear that San Francisco was the center of the startup and technology world, right? Like, like you completely, could, right? Like every neighborhood was becoming busier, like rents and property prices kept getting like more and more expensive. Like it was very clear the center of everything. And People then hated hit. techies more and more. <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, yeah. Like yes. I think that was partly sparking the backlash. Office vacancy was like zero point five percent. Yeah, new apartment buildings, especially in like the area where the Salesforce Tower was built. I, I always felt that felt like another turning point. Like huge tower, like that whole area. We had our um, startup office was based right around the corner from there, and just the new apartment buildings going up on every block. Like it really felt the center of everything. I remember in twenty nineteen it seemed like one of the biggest problems that YC had was that there was not enough place to put all the people who wanted to move to San Francisco. Like there was not enough housing, there was not enough office space. We were just like bursting at the seams. Yep. And then COVID hit. What happened in COVID? (laughs) Yeah. How things kind of turn around so downturn in a matter of few months. Yeah, everything changed in a matter of a few months. I think right up until COVID, Everything we said is very true. Like there, it was clearly the center of the tech world. Like everything, people were moving, but there were clearly problems with the city. Like beneath the surface, like homelessness was increasing. Like crime was increasing. Like there were all these like tensions that people looked past because like you had to be here. And then I felt like COVID hit. Remote work became like necessary, and it was a chance for a lot of people to finally move out and experience living in another city where they didn't have as many of these problems that San Francisco did. It's like I would meet people who would talk about San Francisco as though, like Jared puts it this way, like Gotham City, right? Like if you're on Twitter or if you were just bumping into casual people, they're like, oh, like San oh, Francisco has fallen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was really like that, right? It was just like, wow. You're like, from San Francisco, I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you go out at night? Yeah. yeah. No, and, it was, and this was basically all of, I think, like 2021 and like most of 2022. And then in the last year, some things have happened that have turned things around and are starting what Gary's calling this boom loop. Like what, what happened in the past year? It's, well, the clear thing is AI, right? Like the um, chat GPT launching um was like a complete like reset and brought everyone back and i think like to garrett like the broader point in order to work on ai pre like the chat gbt3 launch you have to be sort of like counterculture misfit it was not at all a mainstream thing to be working on it was, it was like not a- cool to work on ai if anything actually you know it was a little bit of a dead end for some people at that point. It like, was a bit how, of one of the AI winters right. back then. And people were 
keep going because they knew something that everyone else didn't. This is that part of being counter. I think it's a really important point because pre that, like, and during the COVID remote work period, there were multiple hubs that had the claim to be like the next Silicon Valley. And I don't think anyone was claiming that like any one of them would be as big as Silicon Valley, but there was just like a, a general view that, hey, like the future of innovation is just going to be distributed and dispersed in like some of it will be New York, some of it will be in LA, some of it will be in London, like all around the world but the thing that actually drove the next wave happened in san francisco and it doesn't seem coincidental like if anything you can argue the fact that the city got so bad and it's still like it's come back and it's like now the center again is just evidence of how strong the like network effects, the effects are, here. are yeah and it's not just open ai basically all the ai ended up in san francisco open ai anthropic scale ai basically all the big ai companies all the big all the big tech AI research labs, it's all in the Bay Area. And now we're saying like post ChatGPT, like we're seeing San Francisco really come back. How is it different? Like what are we seeing that's like different in sort of this iteration of San Francisco versus like the peak pre-COVID? Well, commercial real estate is down. <laughs> but um, I guess the wild thing is like we still have some real big problems downtown and uh, in large parts of soma and soma was sort of where they allowed to you know they where they allowed developers to build housing and by default i think a lot of people watching this who are not from san francisco a lot of them might end up in soma and then realize oh this isn't a place where i want to live and then they leave but you know i think the thing I want people to sort of understand is like Cerebral Valley is not Soma. Cerebral Valley is actually a play on Hayes Valley, which is in the center of the city. There's lots of incredible food and, you know, shops. And like that's where a lot of uh, the best AI companies are choosing to be. Uh, right now we're sitting in the Y Combinator offices. We signed more than 100,000 square feet here. So, you know, the amazing thing now is we can have, you know, three different events going all at the same time over here. Like this is a, a very different part of town that uh, has a neighborhood vibe that's very safe. And so, you know, explore the neighborhoods, figure out, don't just do the default thing, which is live in FIDI or SOMA. Like there are so many neighborhoods that are incredible and they might cost a little bit more, but you will get the real San Francisco experience if yeah, you do Yeah, as that. someone that moved back, I think the single thing that struck me most that's different is how much the neighborhoods have changed. Like it really matters which neighborhood you're in now. I feel like pre-COVID, you sort of you knew like the tenderloin the civic center where like the bad areas of san francisco and outside of that every neighborhood maybe had a slightly different flavor but it didn't actually matter too much if you were based in like soma versus fidei or all the or even the mission but like now it's like it's very important that you pick the right neighborhood right um like and we i feel like yc like now we're in like the dog patch which we sort of lucked into, I would say, like what is probably the best neighborhood in San Francisco. Yeah. Like, we, How about we, we think... talk about moving YC to San Francisco, which is something we talked about for years, but COVID happened and other things happened. And like now we were finally in a position to do that. And you two actually led the search for YC's new headquarters. Do you want to talk about like the places that you looked at and how we ended up here? I mean, there were lots of neighborhoods, lots of different other places. But uh, if anything, we did it startup style, which is uh, dog patches really safe. Um, it's being redeveloped. Um, and this is actually before OpenAI moved in over here. And then there was a space uh, right next to where we are right now that was the powerhouse for Pier 70. So it literally housed the, uh, the engines that generated the power for uh, where we are, which is the shipyards that built a third of the uh, U.S. Navy during World War I and II. So it's sort of like this incredible uh, symbolic significance of um, so much power being generated in that, <laughs> that house. So th that's actually our main event area. And then we just took over the, uh, the office next door. And so you know, now we have a really sweet YouTube studio right here. And across the street, there's also two other YC companies, Astranis and also Gusto, right? The dog patch is great. That's where our center of gravity is. But what some of the pushback you will get from founders about moving to San Francisco and things they're worried about and what's the advice you give them? Especially uh, international founders, there's a lot of uh, the consumption of news is from Twitter and it, it, there's a lot of things about being not safe and being scared of coming here. But when they actually move to the right neighborhood, they're pleasantly surprised, yeah. which is which is nice. 
But it, this is not to say that the city doesn't have problems. There's definitely neighborhoods that t- they still should avoid, which we actively advise them where to be, actually. Which, which are the neighborhoods? Where should people be based? I mean, personally, I love you know, Mission Dolores, Noe Valley. These are great areas. They're a little bit more expensive. I think you know, Glen Park is actually an incredible neighborhood that's sort of, you know, hidden. Bernal Heights is uh, right over the hill from, uh, you know, where we're at in the dog patch in Petrero Hill. Uh, Mission Bay is brand new, so and it's very close to YC. So that's and actually... And OpenAI. And OpenAI. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I actually think that, you know, during the batch, we actually tell people, can you be within a mile of Y Combinator in the dog patch. And the reason why is, you know, you're going to be working 80, 90 hours a week, like writing code or talking to users. But, you know, on those Friday nights, you're going to come out to uh, actually this office and we have, you know, uh, a launch event where people demo their software and grab a beer. And then afterwards they go out to the bar or grab grab pizza. And then, you know, Friday and Saturday nights, that's when you can let your hair down a little bit and actually you know, see the other people in your batch. And then those are the relationships that um, you sort of take with you for, frankly, the rest of your life. I mean, one of the more surprising things that uh, I'm still surprised by is, you know, when I got married after doing YC, two whole tables were my Stanford friends, but two whole tables uh, were actually my Y Combinator friends. And uh, Paul Graham even came and he even wore pants. (laughs) (laughs) There's a there's actually a founder map that lays out where all of the founders of the current batch are staying, and the center of gravity is around our office here in Dogpatch, and that's not random reason. That's by design, and maybe we can talk about why is that. I mean, I remember in my uh, YC batch, we actually did the manual version of this, making a collaborative Google map in summer of 2008, and this was while it was still in Boston. And the funniest thing was. Uh, that's how I got to know my co-founder, Brett Gibson. Uh, him and his co-founder were working on a different startup called Slinkset. Um, and we actually would just grab beer, pizza and beers every weekend. And when they couldn't raise money, we ended up uh, sort of merging our companies. And then so Brett Gibson, who ended up being my co-founder for Posterous, uh, ended up being my co-founder for Post Haven, and then also worked with us at YC on the software team, and now he runs uh, Initialized. And it all started by just him happening to live next to you in Boston when you were going through YC. And so where you live, who you hang out with, I mean, it's pretty wild that these things end up mattering. And, you know, San Francisco is the best place in the world to sort of build that network that few i mean you're not building a network you're actually just making friends for life and that's like the real version of it and then you mentioned cerebral valley it did actually start as hayes valley in like a play on that yeah. but i actually think like cerebral it, valley is this of, neighborhood it actually is this, it's kind of weird that cerebral valley became known as hayes valley i think the real origin for that is just that there is this one hacker house in hayes valley but it was literally just a house. <laughs> but again, to what we're talking about, during the period that that hacker house started, San Francisco was pretty dead. Yeah, it was it was so dead that like the hacker house was probably <laughs> yeah. like the most happening you, place. You could become the center of San Francisco by literally having the one house, house. That has, like <laughs> ten hackers in it working on like AI stuff, right? Exactly. But like it's not true today. Like OpenAI has this huge lease right around the corner from here in like Mission Bay, which is next to the dog patch. We're here. Like the startups are going to start being based here. Like this seems. Like it's the real this center, is the real c- cerebral valley, yeah, this right is, here. This yeah. is the real cerebral valley, and I think a lot of the companies that we're working in, with right now, uh, they're going to find product market fit. They're going to get their first million, then ten million, then hundred million, then billion dollars a year in net revenue. They're going to fill the office towers in FIDI and Soma. They're going to build these businesses that create thousands of jobs and there's not going to be you know one salesforce tower there might be dozens if not hundreds in the next 10 years and so we're really talking about a real boom loop here this is already happening i was talking to companies from the last couple batches and there's this uh, office space in soma where there are a bunch of yc companies that just got that just raised their seat round and they're surrounded around each other and they feel the energy. There's this thing about being in the right vibe. <laughs> they need a cool name like Y Scraper then. I think we're also seeing like another just effect of 
being here is like the AI specifically, like if you're working on developer tools, like in a big area right now, like you want to be here, like all of the best engineers who are gonna be using your like cutting edge developer tool or infrastructure are all based out here. If you're building AI software, you need someone especially enterprise software, you need someone who's going to be your champion and advocate and is going to take a bit of a bet on like a startup that's using some, you know, like cutting edge AI model that's not fully proven yet. And they're all like, those people tend to be here. It's always clear that you can build companies outside of San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Like there's always going to be exceptions and maybe there'll actually be more of them over time. But I just think all else being equal, if you're starting out, like you and you want to play just maximize the odds to be in your favor like you should you should be here despite the the fact that there will always be exceptions why don't you want to get more lucky here in yeah, san francisco right? <laughs> yeah maximize your luck so the great thing is i mean we want san francisco to be hyper inclusive and what that means is uh you don't have to pay that much for rent uh, you can feel safe walking down the street there's great small businesses that are uh, you know, thriving. And then frankly, this is the place where you should start your startup and thrive here as well. A hundred years from now, what does San Francisco look like in tech? I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Gene Roddenberry's ideal for Starfleet Command. I mean, this is the ultimate techno-optimist dream, which is we unlock so much abundance in the world that money doesn't exist anymore. And people can search the stars to try to find and create their own meaning. Um, and I, I think that there's no mistake, like Starfleet Command from Star Trek, The Next Generation, and Star Trek, you know, the universe broadly, it's like right there in the Presidio in San Francisco. I think that um, if you take the agglomeration effects of the smartest people in the world, the best builders in the world, and you put them in one place and they create this scene, like this um, you know, set of people who all run in the same direction, create these companies that matter, and then people stay here. And you know, they make the schools awesome. They build housing. They actually you know, invest into arts. We actually make the city the kind of the best city in the world. Like we have all the building blocks to make San Francisco into the best city in the world where you know, give us your misfits, give us your nerds, give us your autists, give us the people who, you know, just wouldn't fit anywhere else. Like they have this capability with their hands and with their brain to create something that has never existed before. And we put them all in one city and they go and create software and hardware and technology and biotech and climate tech. For, that will touch billions of people, and all of that wealth comes back into this one city, and we make the city more and more awesome. That's what San Francisco is. That is what San Francisco could be, and we will manifest this. The boom loop is happening, guys. <laughs> so maybe that's a great place to end. That's it for this week of The Light Cone. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>